Hey guys, Level Cap here, and welcome to another episode of This Week in Gaming. Today, we're going to start off by focusing on Star Citizen 3.0. The latest major version of this game has been released to a select group of players, but the important thing is that the NDA is now removed. So no longer is it a closed testing environment. We can stream it, we can play it, we can make videos on it. And uh, this was the first time for me joining up a 3.0 server and testing out Planetary Landing. This is a major step forward for the persistent universe of Star Citizen. The feature has been demoed many times before within a closed environment by the developers themselves, but never has it really been widely released to the public to test out. And this is the very first iteration of that. And for me, my very first planetary landing was quite a magical experience. I was nervous because, while well, the current version of the game or the current test version of the game is extremely buggy, uh, very laggy, servers are kind of pushed to their limits at the moment, but the landing went off without a hitch for the most part. Going through the atmosphere and watching your spaceship catch on fire as the atmosphere itself slows your ship down with realistic physical properties is really kind of incredible. And at certain points you're thinking, uh, is my ship just going to catch on fire and explode here? Like, I don't, I'm not a rocket scientist. I don't know what an appropriate angle of approach is or what the stresses of my ship can actually handle. But uh, I think these things are built pretty well. I made it through the atmosphere. And then we start to watch the details of the planet come into more and more focus. And as I fly over the surface of this fully physical, realized planet in the Star Citizen universe, it kind of dawned on me that every inch of this planet is not only detailed, but fully explorable. And that's kind of a frightening concept. I mean, this is just like a moon. This is a tiny planet, but the size of it is big enough that no player could simply explore every inch of it, or let alone the fact that there's hundreds of moons and planets and systems that are gonna be in this final realized persistent universe. Even in the test server right now, there's enough places to land and enough asteroids and planets and moons to touch down on that uh, it feels like there's an unlimited amount of content to sort of explore and try out. Obviously, it's not totally real. Most of the planet is barren and there's not really anything to do on it, but they have outposts with missions and different things going on. So you can actually do stuff right now. And here we go with the first physical touchdown. This is always kind of a scary moment because we're we're testing is is this planet solid can i actually put my ship on the surface will it touch down realistically and there we go we got cool dust effects as the sand blows in the wind and then i can simply get out of my cockpit and walk off the ship now of course it didn't work quite as smoothly as that things were buggy and glitchy and laggy and i got stuck on things along the way but eventually got the cargo lift to go down and in Neil Armstrong fashion took my very first character steps on a foreign planet or moon, I guess, in this case. But uh, it's incredible just walking out of the ship and realizing that, hey, this works. The most ambitious concept that this game has tried to undertake is actually now in the test version of the game and it's working. It's not working well. We spawned a Ursa rover and it fell through the planet's surface. But you know what? You win some, you lose some. My brother landed his ship right next to mine on the planet. We got out, we spawned a little hover bike, flew around with it, then the server totally pooped out and crashed. But I still came away from the experience pretty much elated and fascinated and wanting to play more of it and excited about the future of Star Citizen. And just to be clear, 3.0 is not just about planetary landing. There's plenty of other things going on in the game right now. New missions, new outposts, new bases, new tons of crazy new stuff to get into and test out. And I haven't even begun to scratch the surface of it. But that is something I hope to do in the near future. Now, if you're thinking about signing up for a Star Citizen account, I encourage you to use this referral code here because it will get you some extra in-game credits that you can use to play around with. And also, it'll help me get closer to earning some high-tier ships that I can hopefully one day check out in the Persistent Universe. In Battlefield 1 related news, the CTE version of the game has released two fully textured versions of the Turning Tides maps, Akibaba and Cape Hells. We also have plenty of the Turning Tides weapons available to play with in-game, and the grappling hook that people were excited about actually just turns out to be a melee weapon, as far as I can tell. 
Now, Cape Hells is played in the Conquest Assault game mode, where one team actually controls all the flags at the start of the round, and the other team has to invade and try and take those flags. So the invading team, the assaulting team, actually gets a destroyer, a player-controlled destroyer. There's four seats in it. There's AA cannons. There's big artillery uh, rounds on it, and it can also call in artillery strikes using its radio. So this is a very powerful weapon. Personally, from playing Cape Hells a bit, I found it to be very unbalanced, and almost every single game I played of it was extremely one-sided. The matches were not close at all, and unfortunately, in the main center area of the map, uh, it's kind of visually uninteresting, and a lot of the capture points play out very similar to one another. I think this map might actually play really well in the operations game mode because it does feature a D-Day beach style assault and I think that could be very cool in operations. When it comes to Akibaba or Achibaba, however you say it, um, there's some cool new trench style combat here. I actually like this map or at least the look of it. It does come with a few issues though. The gameplay can be fun. Some of the spawns are really bad putting you right in the middle of a full enemy squad sometimes when you spawn in on like a flag point and on top of that we also ran into I would say maybe three games in which one of the teams ended up getting spawn camped so there was some map design flaws here but from a visual standpoint and stylistically different trenches I thought it was a nice change of scenery. The Turning Tides DLC with these two maps and six new weapons will be released on December 11th for premium owners and two weeks later for everyone else. Also, two more maps for this DLC will be coming in January. Star Wars Battlefront 2 really can't seem to stay out of the headlines these days, and that's a bad thing for the most part because all of the headlines have been bad. This latest one is no exception. Now that EA has removed the microtransaction system of the game, preventing players from using actual money, to buy upgrades or progress their characters in the game, the progression system for the game is somewhat slow and players are taking advantage of a stupidly easy to use exploit. This is something I saw coming a long time ago and is just one of the many ways to exploit this horribly designed progression system. So what players are doing is they're joining servers and they're putting rubber bands around their console controllers to keep their characters moving and running around. This prevents them from getting kicked for being idle and they can basically stay in the game the whole match. They will not contribute to the match and it ruins the game for other players who are actually trying to play it, but at the end of the game, it gives them a huge credit reward for sticking around. The credits are based on the time spent in the game at the moment and a little bit based on your performance but the difference between the top performing player in a game and the worst performing player in the game is like a five percent difference in credits earned so it's no big deal and people are able to basically get just as many credits from playing the game afk as they would if they were playing the game for actually being there this allows people to generate a lot of credits and unlock stuff in the game, but it's also ruining the game experience for many players as the quantity of AFK players has increased exponentially from this. We saw many things like this in games that have poorly designed progression system or credit earning system. It happened in player unknowns battlegrounds for a while as people were just AFKing their way to a lot of credits and loot boxes. This is not surprising to me in the slightest. DICE makes these oversights all the time, and this is honestly just one of many ways to cheese and exploit the system. They need to make a lot of changes to get this game up and running properly. Rainbow Six Siege's next DLC, Operation White Noise, has been available to play in the early test servers of the game, and you can check out the new operators that will be available. There's some new weapons, and Dokabi is probably my favorite new operator, as she has the ability to hack enemy player cell phones, and if another player dies, she can then hack their cell phone to gain access to the enemy team's camera. I think it's really cool having an elite hacker as one of the new operators, and uh, I think she's going to be an important part of Rainbow Six meta going forward. Then we also have the defensive operator Vigil who can activate an ability to become invisible on cameras and drones. And then we also have the offensive operator Zofia who comes with a cool double barreled grenade launcher. Operation White Noise will be available to people who have the year two season pass on uh, November 27th and for public release on December 4th. And finally, the PUBG test server has released a new update with some really cool UI improvements and two new weapons, including an AUG A3 that is bound 
to a loot crate drop. So it's gonna be pretty hard to get that. I have a video detailing all the aspects of this new patch. And also players have data mined a few cool new weapons from the game files like a lever action rifle and a sawed off shotgun. Also a flare gun. So we'll see if any of that stuff makes it into the final game, but still kind of cool to see what's being uncovered through data mining. The 2013 Crytek developed free to play shooter Warface just got a recent update that introduces a new PVP battle royale mode. This mode is different from existing battle royales in that it focuses on a 16 player game size and the matches last between 3 to 5 minutes. Again, I did a video on that earlier this week and I really enjoy the pacing of it. For anyone who gets bored with the 30 plus minute long games of PUBG, you might actually really enjoy this version of a battle royale game that's far less focused on looting. It is a beta version right now and there's plenty of things that I think need to improve, but it's still a nice alternative. Anyway, that wraps it up for today's episode of This Week in Gaming. As always, I hope you guys enjoyed it and I'll see you next time. This is Level Cap signing off.